All right, I think I've told various stories over, over the years of, of my exploits, such as they were in, uh, in athletics in, in high school. And I've already admitted I was a bad athlete. But that said, in 1989, that was my freshman, freshman year of high school, and this was the last year. We had lived in the, in the Bay Area in California for several years, and this was my last year in the Bay Area in California, in 1989. But I was a freshman in high school uh, at that time, San Ramon Valley High. And I was going to play sports. You know, I, was, I was very uh, uh, athletically inclined, if not athletically gifted. So I wanted to play different sports. Well, the one sport I had an opportunity uh, to, to try out for uh, that I'd never played uh, a moment in my life up to that point was the sport of water polo. Now, we're in California. There's a lot of pools. And uh, water polo was, was a thing there. And so I, I tried out for the water polo team. Now, I thought to myself that uh, this, this, how hard can this be? I mean, we all played with the ball in the pool and you throw it around. And I thought this, this is something I think I, I can you know, have at least a basic, a basic mastery of moving left and moving right in the water and catching something and throwing. I figured how hard can, can that be? It's not hitting a 90-mile-an-hour you know, fastball or anything like that. With that said, I tell you right now, I was woefully uh, unprepared and not educated about what's involved in water polo. Has anyone ever played water polo? I see it's not, not, not a sport that we, we've encountered too much here. So water polo, here's the thing. What you, if you ever watch it on TV, what you'll see is what everybody sees. You see people you know, moving and dodging, and the taller people, you know, the taller people would do, do quite well. If, if you had some wingspan, you were in great shape, which also limited me you know, somewhat. Uh, I, wasn't, I could tread water with the best of them, but I couldn't swim very fast, and I couldn't get the arms up all that, all that much. But with that said, if you had good wingspan, you were in business. And yet I figured, you know, again, this is, this is going to be fun and fairly easy. But what I didn't realize is that maybe 80% of the level of effort and the strategy that takes place in the game of water polo or the sport of water polo occurs underneath the water. See, it's underneath the water that all manner of dirty tricks occur. It's underneath the water there's all manner of pushing off, all manner of things and shoves and elbows just in the right spot. People in water polo know exactly, exactly where to put an elbow to, to somewhat slow down uh, the people around them. There's uh, speedos that get yanked in weird directions. There's all sorts of stuff. I'm not kidding you. I, I had no idea. I had no idea. I go in as a freshman, and I think, you know, I can't be that bad, right? I was bad. But not only was I bad because I didn't understand the degree and the complexity and all the strategy and pushing and shoving that goes on under the water, not only because I didn't understand that, but I was also ill-prepared physically for what would happen if I tried to exercise muscles that I had never utilized for this purpose across the course of the first two-hour workout that I engaged in. Of all the time I spent in youth athletics, and like I said, I was not good, but I was active, and I spent a lot of time in youth athletics. I never had a class, I never had a training session or a practice that left me as dead on my feet as that one day in 1989. And in hindsight, I mean, I didn't, I was red-faced and I was as sore as could be when that was over. But in hindsight, I recognized that my main problem was simply that I was legitimately using muscles in that scenario that I just wasn't accustomed to. When you swim, I don't know if you know, folks swim here uh, frequently uh, in our church family, but when you swim, you use muscles, generally speaking, that are a little bit different than when you're walking, running, and the like. Well, in water pole, it's the same way. I was using muscles I don't think I even knew I had, and they were all very, very sore. Now, here's, here's the time. Here's the point. When people come to... Christianity or come to church or, or even sometimes when we're new Christians, at some level we think, you know, how hard can this be? At some level, you know, there's the Bible and there's prayer and church and singing and choirs and so forth. We think it's, it's you know, it's kind of entry-level activity. And then we pick up Leviticus. Then we pick up a book in the Bible that's challenging, Romans. Then we hear a sermon that uses a word like, uh, you know, propitiation, sanctification, justification, glorification. We realize maybe there's more to this than not. There's times in our Christian walk where we realize maybe the depth of what I've gotten into is far deeper than anything I expected. And I'm still in the kiddie pool with regards to my faith and maybe my understanding. So the question is, how do we grow? And all of us are growing in matters of faith, from, from the, the pastor and elders on through. All of us are growing in matters of faith. But how do we do it, especially when we're newer to matters of faith? Well, again, that's going to be our principle focus. Let me skip ahead now on our slides and let's talk a little bit about how you form habits to begin with. 
where do habits come from? Where do habits come from? How do habits uh, develop? Repetition. Okay. So re repetition, what was that? Repetitive action. So repetitive action. So habits are formed by doing something and then doing it again and then doing it and the like. From your background? From your background? Okay, yeah, the, certainly some habits are formed on the basis of the way you grew up, or the way you were raised. If, if uh, your parents got you out of bed at 6 a.m., you got used to getting out of bed at 6 a.m. Over, over time. So some of the habits are kind of you know, forced upon you by life and circumstances and, and other things. With that said, habits, when you're older, oftentimes need some sort of compulsion. Habits, when you're older, uh, need some compelling uh, thing or event or circumstance to occur before you're willing to start a habit that maybe you didn't grow up with. I'll give you an example. We've got, uh, there's a gentleman in our, in our neighborhood, and uh, he lives uh, just, just down the street, and used to see him very in, infrequently, uh, but then all of a sudden, I encountered him. I, I go out walking, walking a lot, and I encountered him on a number of walks, and so talked to him a little bit, and yeah, I see you're out walking, and he said, well, yeah, yes, I am. And can you guess what he said next? He said, the doctor told me. <laughs> the doctor told me I needed to. Right, exactly. The doctor, he said something about the heart. I, I didn't get into all the details. But there was a health concern. And the health concern was big enough and scary enough and daunting enough that the doctor said, you need to do X, Y, Z. You need to get the exercise. You need to be moving around or else you might die. You know, something along, along those lines. So there he is walking. He formed a habit out of a compulsion. He formed a habit out of a compelling need uh, to, to do that. So that's one way that habits form. It's not necessarily the, the healthiest way. If all your habits came at, you know, at gunpoint, so to speak, that's, that's not really the way you want it to develop, but some do, some do. Now, other habits when we're older form on the basis of, of motivation. And our motivation can be a, a factor of, of a number of, of different things. If you are motivated to save money, let's say that uh, something happens to your employment, you're in a tough spot, you're motiv motivated to save money, what are some of the habits you might suddenly develop if you need to save money? Give me one. Record keeping. Record keeping. You might suddenly say, boy, where's all the money going? How do we get into this bind? What is the deal here? So you might suddenly be much more you know, careful about your record keeping. What else might you do if, if uh, if you realize that you're having some dilemmas financially and you needed to tighten the belt, what's something else you would do? Budget. You'd budget, so you may allocate your funds differently. Okay. Yeah, but budgeting is, is, is wise and good and, and appropriate. Something else that, that, uh, I've, you know, that I've done at times, what's that? Something else to help you save? Yeah. If, is anyone here into coupons? Okay, so coupons. So, now here, here's the thing. There was a season of my life. Uh, we've, Anna and I, over the years, we've, we've had, you know, I think in like Ecclesiastes, there's a season for this and a season for that. Well, across all the years from college through, there were some seasons that were more challenging, you know, for us, uh, fiscally and the like. And there were seasons where you're a lot more careful about finances, and there are seasons where you get into coupon mode. You know, you get that bit, you open a mailbox, and I don't know, <laughs> you, can, you can relate? Yeah, the QR code, right. Yeah, they say if you use those, you'll get coupons right. and you can go to the store and stuff like that. So I learned that. It's, a, it's, it's helpful. It allows you to, to save money. We've gotten into using apps you know, for, for, for like you know, fast food or whatnot. You go to Burger King and you, you, know, boop, you, know, you show them that and you get, I got, I got 10 points towards my next meal. So, so how do they, what kind of deal, right? So the point, though, the point being that coupons are a habit that, again, you're motivated to, to do it. Now, some folks, even when they're not motivated to do it, they just like doing it. Everyone you know, likes saving money. I mean, that's, that's always nice, and that's, that's one way to go about it. So you might be motivated uh, to save money, and as a result, you might be inclined to, to uh, clip uh, coupons. Um, if whatever your, your given motivation uh, might be, if you're inclined... Uh, to, to look good for a job or a future spouse or something like that. You might exercise more. You might develop habits in accordance with some, with some want. 
A lot of people work out, especially when they're young, because of the ideas. I want to get in fine physical form for athletics or just to look good for prospective spouses or what have you. The point is they develop a regimen and a habit and they get out and do things because they see some objective in view. And nothing wrong with that. That's, that's perfectly, perfectly valuable. But at the same time, the opposite's true as well. You will not form habits for that you don't value. You will not develop, if, there, if you're lacking a habit in an area that you need it, in all probability, the reason you don't have the habit is because you really don't value the thing that you need. So, you know, there's people, and I've been in this as well, that you go to the doctor and the doctor says you should do X, Y, Z for whatever the reasons are. And you nod him and you thank you, sir. <laughs> you you, you well-meaning you know, individual, you nod and you take it. It's like when you go to the dentist. How many times do you go to the dentist? You're right, and the dentist will say, you need to floss. And then they even show you how, like you've never been shown how to floss. You know, they're putting around the fingers and this is how you do it and all that. Yeah, and so the different medical practitioners assume, assume at some level that the person sitting there either doesn't know how to or doesn't want to do the things that they should do. So they're going to review it with you, and then guess what? In many cases, you'll be back the next year, and the same discussion will take place. Now, if you're a physician, at some level, you might be going, what is, what's the deal here? Oh, and you know the deal. The deal is not that they don't understand, like how to floss. It's not that they don't understand. It's just that they don't want to. They don't value it to the degree that you as a dentist are admonishing them that they, that they should. Please do X, Y, Z. It'll be for your, in your best interest. And they nod at you. This happens in church circles a lot, too. They nod at you very politely say, yes, that sounds wonderful. I, I'm going to get right on that. And then they go about their life, and their choices don't necessarily reflect it. So habits don't form with regards to things we don't value. Habits will not develop uh, with regards to those things that we don't think are especially important. Now let's get back to matters of Scripture. Let's get back to, to matters of faith. If you value learning uh, about God, what are some things that you would do? If you want to know God better, what's the main thing you're going to do? Read His Word. Right, read His, read his Word. Can you hand me one of the Bibles in front of you? So, thank you. So if you, if you want to know God better, there's no, this is not a secret, right? If you want to know God better, you know, here's, here's the book. You know, people are always saying, I want a word from the Lord, right? I want a, I want a word. Well, here's, here's I don't know, 2,000 pages worth of words from the Lord. People say, ah, yeah. I mean, I want to hear him, hear him speak. Do you want to hear God speak? Do you want to hear God speak audibly? Read it aloud, right? You've heard that before. But this principle is the same. It's right here. From one end to the other, he tells you about himself. He tells you about why you're here, what you exist to do. He tells you about the future, what's going to go down. He tells you what he expects of you and your purpose in life and all these different things. It's right here. And he'll say it in one book on one page, and then he'll say it again because we can be slow to learn. He'll say it again and again and again and again and again and again. With that said, with that said we have to have a willingness to, to pick it up. If you want to know God better, the principal means of instruction, the principal way you're going to accomplish it is going to be uh, through his word. At the same time, if I said, would you like to grow in your relationship with God? Now, if I ask that up front, would you, uh, Christians, would you like to grow in your relationship with God? Well, it's going to, right. It's, it's 100%. It's like if you were, if someone asked you, do you want to grow in your relationship with your mom or your dad? Yes, I want to grow in that relationship. So how do we do that? As Christians, what's the principal means God has given us to grow in our relationship with Him outside of the Word? Dedication. Dedication. Prayer. Prayer. Right. Prayer is, the principal, prayer is the principal means by which we grow in our walk. See, and here's the irony, and this, is, this I've encountered more often than I ever expected. There can be times and folks and seasons where people can actually get the theology and, st and read the Bible quite a bit. And yet, and yet their actual walk and relationship with God is a big gap. We, I, I see this more often than I expect, and I think part of it is because the denomination and the schooling that we're in uh, really uh, um, emphasizes the academic side of things and the theology and the doctrine, and that's, that's good. But at the same time, you can find that someone can have a pretty good grasp of theology and yet still have a, a, a distant relationship with God. And their comfortness with, with praying and you know, working through with him and, and their prayer life and such, it's, it's just not there. If you ask them to tell you about sanctification, they'll, they'll tell you, here's, here's what it is. But as far as their actual ongoing walk with God, it's just, it's just not there as much. 
Now, I've said in the past that, that God made us to be uh, in relationship with him. From the very get-go in, in the garden, for God forms Adam, God forms Eve, he puts them you know, together. And then what did God do? Did he stare at him through a telescope from 10,000 miles away? No. He did what? He walks with him in the cool of the afternoon, right? He walks with him. He walks with me and he talks with me. You heard the song, right? He walks. I'm not going to sing. So he walks with him and he talks with him. How cool must that have been? Before the first sin fractured that relationship, how awesome must it have been for, for Adam and Eve to converse with one another and say, what do you think about that, Jesus? What do you think about that, God? And we know it to be Jesus that walked and talked with him because which of the three persons of the Trinity was it going to be? It's not going to be God the Father. It's not going to be the Spirit. It's the Son. There's many times where the pre-incarnate Christ shows up in the pages of the Old Testament, and that's one of them. He walked and he talked with God's people, and there was only two of them at that time, in the, in the garden, and they had this great, wonderful relationship. Well, that's what we're made for. And in, in time, that's what will be restored to us. Do you think there's ever a time when you'll hold Jesus' hand? You better believe it. You better believe it. He will literally wipe tears away from your eyes. I think he's going to give you his hand, too. I think he'll give you a hug. I think that's on your radar. Sometimes we can put that at such arm's length and not see that future through the eyes of faith that, that, it, that Scripture paints it in. Somehow take Jesus and say, you're forever at arm's length for me. Well, what do you think the whole purpose of salvation is? It's to bring you into reunion, unity, conformity with his word and will so that you can dwell with him forever. Yes, you will walk and talk with Jesus. It will be wonderful. We don't know exactly all that it looks like, but it's there and it will be wonderful. So anyway, getting back to to habits, the point is that our prayer life is a way we can do that now. You understand? It's not just like, someday I hope to be able to talk to God, right? Someday I look forward to being able to to share my deepest thoughts with my maker. I can't wait for that to happen. You can do that right now. In fact, you're supposed to. I've I've said this again at at other intervals. In my own walk, remember I went to a Reformed Presbyterian seminary that was very high on the academics and, and, and the like and all the $8 words, and I enjoyed it, and I, I was blessed by it. But my prayer life developed uh, much more after seminary than it did during seminary. After seminary, I got into a habit. I forget exactly what year this was. It was when we were in Wyoming. But I got in a habit of, of walking and just praying aloud as I walked. There's not a lot of people in Wyoming. You can cover a lot of space with that. <laughs> Anyone thinking you're, you're, a, you're a loon. So I would walk and I would pray. And then when I when we moved to Georgia, it was a, a church in, in Georgia, I had a sanctuary. It was similar size to this. I'd come in, especially on Saturdays, and I'd do what I do here. I'd come in on Saturdays and I just, I just walk. I just walk and I pray aloud. And if there's people in the church, sometimes I have to close the doors. So again, no one thinks I'm odd, but I, I pray aloud. And I find that the reason I pray aloud is because it helps me clarify my own thoughts. Sometimes when you're just praying, you're sitting there just, they're just praying away. And, but before you know it, some other thoughts, you know, something goes by, this, you know, by your vision. Before you know it, you thought you were praying. And you've spent the last 10 minutes thinking about Alabama football, right? I thought it out for Gardner. He's not here. And, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, but you understand what happens. Before you know it, you're, you're, you're somewhere else mentally. I find that when I pray aloud, that it helps me to stay more focused. It also brings more clarity to what it is I'm praying for. When you hear yourself say something aloud, it might sound stupid or faster to you, if it indeed it is stupid. It might sound like this is something, oh gosh, boy, I need to ch- check my motivation on such a thing. But sometimes when you're just mentally just, you know, just praying abstractly, it's hard, it's hard to do that. Now, that's my personal approach. I don't do it all the time, but I do it often enough, and I found it helpful. So for what it's worth, I, I, do, uh, I do recommend that, that approach. But whatever the case, growing in our walk with, with God requires two central things, and that is a greater level of effort with regards to Scripture and a greater level of effort with regards to prayer. And I do not think that you should elevate one above the other. I think they're both essential. They're both worthy of your time. And if you find that one of the two is harder for you, then focus some intentional efforts there, and we'll walk through some ideas of how you can do that in just a little bit. Now, before we get into biblical examples of habits and and routines, does anyone remember the... uh, My favorite Disney movie when I was growing up was uh, Alice in Wonderland. Anyone remember the cartoon version of that? 
I don't know why the, the, the Cheshire Cat was just my my favorite of all the of all the you know things that were that were in the realm of Disney, and and I think it's partly because even at that point he, the Cheshire Cat's kind of a philosopher. You know the things he's he's saying and the like. Now in hindsight, now that I have theological training, I realize it's all stupid. But at the time, I was like, boy, this cat is so deep and how interesting. So there's a there's a scene where Alice is entering into the you know this garden or not the garden, the forest, and she encounters this this Ch Cheshire Cat, and she's lost and she doesn't know exactly where she's at. And she doesn't know exactly where she should go. She encounters the cat, and and so she asks the cat a question. And she says, which which way should I go? And the cat re responds and says, well, it, de it depends on where you want to get to, right? And so she thinks for first a moment, and she says, well, I suppose it doesn't really matter. She doesn't know what the benefit of going left, right, north, east, south, west in this weird place is. So she goes, I, I don't suppose it really matters. And the cat responded and said, well, then it doesn't matter which way you go. If you have no uh, clarity of focus or where you're trying to get to, then it really doesn't matter what path you take tomorrow, the next day, or what have you. If you have no object of your Christian walk, for example, then it really doesn't matter if you go and sit on the sidelines. If the Christian walk is a race and you're supposed to strive to the finish line, as the Apostle Paul has said, if, if you don't really value that, you don't see the finish line, you don't even see yourself on the race, then you'll send all, spend all your time at the snack bar, so, so to speak. Let, let me give you an example. R.C. Sproul gave, gave this one. It's a different movie, but... The Wizard of Oz. So Wizard of Oz, we of course know the story, roughly opens with, with Dorothy uh, you know, landing in, in Oz. The house you know, comes down, she ends up in Oz, she sees all the munchkins, and then there's the yellow brick road. Now along the way she encounters a few people. What's one of them? Lion, the lion Scarecrow, what's the third one? Tin the Tin Man, right. Now each one of them needed something. What did the lion need? Courage. Yeah, courage, right. And the Tin Man needed? A heart, and what was the other one? The scarecrow needed a brain. The scarecrow needed a brain. Right. So now what did Dorothy need? What? She needed to get home, right? I want to go home. That was her whole, the whole thing. So you got four different individuals. They all have an objective. They're all something that they need, something that they want. You want courage. You want a heart. You want brains. You want to go home. And they take this path, they take this, this, you know, the yellow brick road is the direction that they're told. You go from here to there, you go meet the wizard and such, and he can take care of all this for you. And so knowing that, that objective in mind, they head down this path, even though it leads them through all manner of dangers, you know, the witch and everything is out to get them. All manner of dangers, but they stay on the path to get to the objective because they think that that's the end game. They think that's the solution. Now, like any anecdote, you can only take this so far, but the point here is that when you have an outcome that you're desirous of, you're far more inclined to stay on the path. If your outcome of your Christian walk, what, what is the outcome of your Christian walk? Sanctification. Sanctification. Let's take the $8 word and let's, let's see if we got a 50 cent word. Or, all right. Be more like Jesus. I like that. Be more like Jesus. Let me ask you, is that, is that the purpose of your walk? Is that the purpose of your life? I should hear way more. Yes, amen. I hope it is. Now, we can get confused and think, well, the purpose of my life is to fulfill my destiny and to do all these grand things. And yes, many of them will be for the kingdom. I will do these great things and the kingdom will be blessed by the things that I do. And that can sound really good as you're telling it to yourself. But that's not God's desire for you principally. God's desire for you principally is that you would be more like his son. Let me give you an example of this. If the day uh, should come when, uh, when you we would meet God and you were to come before God and you were to, to talk about the things you'd accomplished and God, I, I did this great thing. You know, pastorally, you know, sometimes in ministry, they equate success in ministry with accomplishing big deeds. You know, I preached to, to thousands of people. I went and wrote these 10 bestsellers, something like that. So let's say you go before God and you say, hey, you heard my, about my bestsellers and all the people I preached to and the like. Yeah, that's, I, I did all that. I mean, you helped me, but I, but I did all. Imagine going before God with the idea that that at all was his purpose and, and primary utility for you and for your life. You would be quickly disabused of that. I think like that. I think God would tell you then what he'll tell you now, that the principal objective of your life is the degree to which you look more like his son. You see, God can raise up, if, if you thought that the objective of my life is, and this is true of those in vocational ministry, if you say, well, my, my objective is to preach to you know, bajillion different people, do all these you know, fancy programs and things and, and the like, 
if you came to God and said, that, look, that's, that's what I did, I think he would look at you and say, you know what? I could have raised up the rocks to do everything you just said. I once used a donkey <laughs> to, to accomplish my, my bidding. If all I needed was thing, someone to say something to someone else, there's a lot of tools I could have used. You weren't here principally to do those things. It's not that those things don't have value. Of course they do. But he was saying it's not, it's not that you're here principally to do that. Your principal objective with the breath that is in your lungs is to be conformed day by day into the image of God's own son. The degree to you which you reflect Jesus is the principal reason that you still have breath today. Mm-hmm. There's more time left to spend, however many, much it is, to become more and more Christ-like. That's the singular objective. We glorify God. If the, the Westminster answer, Brian Kelly, what's the Westminster answer for the purpose of life? What do we exist to accomplish? Glorify God. <laughs> glorify God. I can see I'm talking to Presbyterians. To glorify God and what? Enjoy. Enjoy Him forever. And that is a wonderful, wonderful answer. But the principal way that you glorify God through your life, the principal way that you glorify your Savior, the principal way that you glorify Jesus Christ in your life is to better reflect Him in the world He's placed you in. That's the principal reason that we're here. That, that's the trajectory. If you're like Alice and you're wandering through the forest of this world saying, where to go, what to do? The cat's right. It doesn't matter. So long as you don't have an objective, something that you're striving for. So if you want to know what to strive for, I just told you. I mean, it's not, again, that's not hidden in the dust jacket. You have to you know, flip to Maccabees in some the Apocrypha or someplace to get to that throughout the book. That's the idea. We exist to glorify God, and the principal way we glorify God is to follow his footsteps and to, be, to do what he has done, to live as, as Christ has lived, to, to honor his commandments, to be more Christ-like in our attitudes and affections and emotions. That's why we're here. And you can do that, and every vocation in this room is different. All of our backgrounds are different. And across the globe, there's vocations and backgrounds and states and nationalities and cultures, and they're all different. But for every Christian, every son and daughter of God across this globe, that main objective remains the same. To glorify God in the context of living out your life in China and Ethiopia and the United States and Gulfport by becoming more Christ-like in your attitudes and affections. That's why you're here. If you ever wondered, what's, where's this road taking me? Well, that's the objective. The more you fix it in your mind, the more then you'll say, well, how am I going to get there? If that's my objective, become more like Jesus, well, maybe I should read more about him. Maybe I should learn more about him. And when you fix the objective in mind, that motivation, the habits tend to follow. You know, something I learned very early on in counseling is people do what they want to do. You ever, you know, sometimes you'll be, I'll be sitting in, in scenarios. Again, I've done this for, for quite some time. And you'll hear interesting things. Things like, oh my goodness. And in the back of your mind, you're going, I, wow, I never encountered that before. But I used to think, how could you make such a choice in this particular area? I remember in my first ministry, I had a number of things actually in the first couple months. I had some counseling sessions that were probably the most difficult I've had throughout my whole ministry. And I remember thinking to myself, how, how could you do the, some of the things that, that you're sharing with me? And I grew to learn that people do what they want to do. If you ever wonder, want to know why someone does something that seems crazy or illogical to you, it's because they want to do it, generally speaking. Generally speaking. So with that said, our habits are a function of our motivation. So start by asking yourself what your motivation is. All right, let's talk a little bit about biblical examples of habits and routines. One of the, the words that I have become more enamored with, theologically speaking, over the past two years than I ever was in all the time preceding it, is the word devout. What does the word devout mean? Okay, committed. I like that. Any other descriptions of of devout? If someone says that is a devout man, what are they saying? So, pious, unfailing dedication. Okay. Yeah, I like that. And I also like pious. What we're getting to is that there's a pattern. There's a consistency. Right? Any one of us could do one holy thing on one day. Right? That was just amazing. You know, we, just, we saved someone's life. We shared the gospel with, with someone. We read through not just one chapter of, of a book, but we read through the entirety of you know, Lamentations. And we'd say, this is more pious than I've been in the past two years combined. Right? We can say, I've hit uh, some high notes. But devout people do this every day. Now, 
being devout, devotion, consistency, commitment is one of the most uh, uh, revered qualities in Scripture. And yet it's one of the hardest ones to do because of all the distractions that exist in the world around us. You see, there's a lot of affiliations that you may have that require no devotion. Is anyone a, a Saints fan here? No one wants to own this. <laughs> All right, there we go. Cardinals fan, I'd probably get the same sort of thing. We got, we'd say, right, you know. And there's different sports teams, right? I would ask what your political affiliation is. We could ask other questions. There's different affiliations that you have. Well, I'm a fan of this team or sport. Uh, I have this, you know, this is my political you know, party or what have you. There's all sorts of affiliations. Sometimes it's just hobbies. Like, I'm a car enthusiast, you might say. That's a fancy way of saying that you like, you know, you like, you like to drive, you like fancy cars and so forth. But most of the affiliations that you would hang on yourself or others would, would say about you require nothing of you from day to day. Right? I can be a car enthusiast. I can be a fan of, let's see, so the Oakland A's. I told you I lived in, in Northern California for a period of time. This was my formative baseball years. So the Oakland A's, this was back in Mark McGuire, Jose Canseco, Ricky Henderson. I had a great time being an A's fan in the, in the 80s. I knew everybody. I knew every, I had all the baseball cards, all the statistics on the cards. Honestly, if you ask me just about anything about that team and who played what positions and who did what on, who played better at night or day or what have you, I could tell you virtually everything. And I'm not kidding. I was really that attuned to, uh, to, uh, to sports and to baseball in this team. Now, I'm still an A's fan. All these years later, it's kind of been a losing cause for, for a number of seasons. I think they're moving now, too, so my, my, uh, my affinity for them might, might, might diminish if they're to relocate. But the point is this, that this past year, I, I, from, there was a time, I was probably in June or July, uh, when I asked myself, well, what's the starting rotation for the A's? And I couldn't name a single pitcher. I still would call myself an A's fan. If anyone asks me, what, what team are I'm an A's fan, right? But I have no devotion to it. I've probably seen... In real life, one game from the A's in the past 10 years, uh, I've probably seen on TV in the past four years a to total of maybe three, four games. So I would take that affiliation. I'd say, I am this. But in reality, there's no devotion to it. And there's any manner of different affiliations I might have or you might have that you would say about yourself or others would say about you, but it requires nothing of you from day-to-day -day life in order to hang on to that affiliation and to claim it. Christianity is different. Christianity is not as something you just, I'm a Christian, right? An affiliation you claim that requires nothing of you. Christianity, at least biblical Christianity, is meant to consume you. It's love, love your Lord your God with what? With all your heart and soul and mind. Not the leftovers, not 80%, not 20% certainly, but with all your heart and your soul and your mind. Being a Christian is not like all the other affiliations that you have. And you probably have many of them. Some of them might be vocational. This is my job. I'm, I belong to these different you know, affiliations within my vocation. There's any manner of things that you might be labeled as. However, the label you have, uh, you have deliberately undertaken when you professed your faith publicly, whether it was in a stage or an interview or something, you need to own that with some behaviors that demonstrate devotion to that which you have professed. Christianity is, is probably more unique among this than, than almost any other affiliation that you may have. Christianity calls us to focus our, our attention and behaviors on our Savior. Now, in Scripture, we see a number of examples of this. The Old Testament, the old, virtually every prophet I, I could point to, but there was a particular text in Daniel chapter 10 uh, that refers to Daniel's uh, devotion, his devoutness. And I'll read it briefly. It says this. It says, Daniel now went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times per day. And he prayed and he gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. Now, does this passage suggest that you and I, in order to emulate it, must therefore go to our window three times a day and pray in the exact same manner? No. But does this level of thoughtfulness and intentionality and setting aside, prioritizing one's time, is that sort of thing something that should be emulated on some level in our lives? Absolutely. You know, our prayer lives for many Christians, you know the time most, of, most Christians pray? 
When is it? When something goes, well, that's true too. It's a, the the piety of the of the Christian saint goes through the roof when you know when something wrong goes on in their life. And in fairness, that's true of all of us. When something when the ground shakes, you look up. Uh, when the ground shakes beneath you, when the storm clouds roll in, you tend to look to God in ways that you otherwise don't. So certainly hardships compel us. Remember, we said that sometimes our habits are brought on by compulsion. Something has happened in your world that now I'm going to be diligent. Now I'm, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be focused. But for many of us, when it comes to prayer life, we pray uh, in a regimen, but the regimen is principally around our mealtimes. And that's not bad. Do that. 100% we do that. In our house. Of course we pray before we eat. Now, just out of curiosity, why do you pray when you eat food? <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't know what's wrong with the food. I'll, I'll rem- <laughs> well, that, there, there may be that. There may be that. If, you, if you've ever been to Wendy's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's one reason to pray. But what's the principal reason? Let's say that you have a wonderful plate of healthy, life-giving food before you. Why would you pray? To thank God. I'm grateful. All right, that's, that's the causation. It's in front of you, and we're, we're, we're taught and instructed, and we've seen this emulated across you know, most of our lives, that that's an appropriate time to pray, to thank God for his provision. And the prayers don't have to be especially lengthy. They, they, they don't have to include every possible thing you might say at that time. But it's appropriate to thank God in that setting for what you've been given. Now, what's another time people pray? When you have little kids, when you pray with them? Bedtime. Yeah, bedtime. Why, why do we do that at bedtime? Right, right. We have a recipe. We, we give God our prescription. I pray to the Lord my soul to keep. You know, if I should die before I wake, right? Bleep, right? And, and sometimes our prayer lives are like that. We give God our prescription. Bleep, we check it, check it in, and we say, I'm good now, right? He's, he's going to honor that prescription because I remember to pray it. If things get too formulaic for you, realize that that's not the intention. God's intention in your prayer life is not that it be a recipe or a formula that you, like an automaton, go to him the same way all the time. In fact, the Lord's Prayer, sometimes people, and I pray the Lord's, whenever I walk around here, I pray the Lord's Prayer. I pray it aloud. But with that said, the Lord's Prayer was given to us as what? As an example, as a model. When you pray, pray like this. Pray like this. The components of your prayer should incorporate things that I'm going to show you how, right? So our prayers are not supposed to be static, automaton things. If you find your prayer life is kind of flagging, and part of it's because you've made it harder on yourself with, well, i got to do this, and this, there has to be a formula, and oh, I missed that part, right? The acrostic acts when we pray, very helpful, very helpful. What are the components? What's the A in acts? Adoration. Adoration. Should you adore God when you pray to God? Amen. Yes, Amen. just read the prophets of the Psalms. Absolutely. God, you're awesome. God, I love you. God, you, you're just amazing. Yes, adoration should be part of it. What's, what's the next one? What's the C? Confession. What, so what is confession? Why do we confess? What? Yeah. Right. We, it goes something like this. I, my person is, God, I'm an idiot, but you're not. God, you're amazing. I mean, that's ador- I, mean I, I, I say it simplistically, but honestly, I, I, I pray that the most basic terms I can come up with, God, I'm an idiot, comes up more often than you would possibly imagine. Adoration, though. I say, God, you're awesome. You're amazing. God, I'm not. This is who I am. I'm fumbling through life and ministry and everything else, but this is who I am, and I need you. And apart from you, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll face plant everything I do from the pulpit on out. So I confess, this is who I am, this is my needs, this is my sinfulness, this is my problems. These are the areas I'm deficient. Now again, I don't have to name every last thing every time I pray, and sometimes we can get in a habit. Martin Luther, remember, he had to do that every time he went to the confessor booth. Right? He'd run to the confessor with, Father, confessor, forgive me for I have sinned. And he'd say all his, his sins. But then what would happen? First of all, he'd wear out the ears of the confessor. You know, so the clock is going by, the candles, all the wax is pooling at the base. And then he's out of breath. And then what happens? He, wa- he leaves the confessor booth. And he remembers one he forgot. And he runs back in and he's got he's to do it again. Why? Well, because Luther, prior to what you would say is his conversion, prior certainly to his understanding of the doctrines of grace, Luther thought you had to do that. Luther thought my interactions are, are, are they're based on the, you know, the, the rosary, on saying this prayer eight times. If I don't say it, you know, if I only say it seven times, that's not sufficient. If your prayer life becomes this hard 
litany of things that you got to do in such an order. If you mess up, God hates you. If you ever get in that kind of mode where I've got to do walk this thing just perfectly in order for God to be pleased with me or for me to, to pass this, this test of faith on this particular day or this particular prayer, I'd say you're, you're, you're missing. You're, you're, the grace of, of a father looking down on a child does not mean that the child has to... Has, it, your child, the, the children that you love, doesn't, don't have to do everything perfectly in order for you to still love them, right? And you want them to strive and, and try, but your love for them doesn't hinge on whether they remembered every last thing that they need to say in the exact order they need to say it. So with that said, we do confess, and there's going to be times where you're not going to confess nearly as much as you ought to. In fact, that's going to be roughly, roughly all the time, but we still confess. So what's the next thing? Adoration, confession, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, and that comes up with the food often, but really everything. What, what, let's come up with five things that we all of us universally have to be thankful for tonight. What's one? Life. What's two? No hurricane. No, no hurricane. You're not wrong about that. And before, before, we end, before we end tonight, which actually is going to rapidly approach us, at about 5-2, we're going to stop and we're going to pray and, and tell Oscar for your help with that, but we're going to pray with regards to the hurricanes that have both affected those in uh, the Carolines as well as Florida. So, with that said, though, Thanksgiving is part of it. We pray for Thanksgiving for life. You know, no hurricanes in our case. What else? What's the third one? What's the health of our family. The health of our family? Okay. Loved ones? Freedom. Freedom. Salvation. I'm a child of God, should always be something we're, we're thankful for. Right. Forgiveness. Right. Forgiveness of sins. I mean, the list can obviously go on, and it doesn't have to be uniform every time, but there should be some sense when you approach God that, God, I, I am grateful for what you've done. And I'm thankful that you've forgiven me a sinner. Remember, that was the prayer. Remember, you had two, the parable where you had the, 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 the Pharisee prays, and, and, was, and the, he's standing next to the tax collector. What was the prayer of the Pharisee? Thank God, Thank God I'm not that guy. <laughs> The Pharisee says, thank God I'm not that guy. What is that guy? What does the tax collector do? He doesn't even, he can't even look up. He's beating his chest. Well, I always say, I, I pray for my short term. Yeah, all my uh, grandkids and stuff. I pray for my short term. Because I always say, yeah, I'm praying. Well, let's keep it up. That's, that's, uh, even when you've been walking with God for, you know, for 80 years, the shortcomings are, are, still, are still present. So we have Thanksgiving. And what's the last one? Supplication, but the, and that's an eight dollar. I think we use that word because it makes acts. I think supplication was chosen in order to make acts work. But what is supplication? Request. Right, requests. It's petitions, praying, dear Lord, I need this in my life. I have this hardship. Oh, if you could only fix X, Y, Z. Now, the irony is that most of our prayer life is reduced to supplication. How much of our prayer life is us going to God and we, you know, yeah, I adore you, I adore you. But we immediately, we give him our prescription. And we are so kind to God. We say, God, here's the problems that I've got, and here's the way you can fix it. <laughs> right? We're very kind. We give them the, we give them the list of stuff. It's like give, when a child gives the list to, you know, for, for what Santa should bring. Here's the list of, of, of what I need. And, and just so you know, I've even told you where you can buy it you know, and so forth, and here it is. Sometimes our supplication works like that. If you find that that's the case, I would say that's not the end of the world. If you have cancer, it's okay to pray, God, please get rid of my cancer. That's perfectly fine. But, but, in supplication, we also step back and we realize that some of the things I'm asking for, I don't need. And some of the things I'm asking for, if you were to give it to me, my life would be worse as a result. Or some other important outcome would be uh, you know, short-circuited. So what did Jesus say in the garden when he prays? Let this cup pass from me, but, but thy will be done. That's the healthiest way to do supplication. You get to supplication, you ask God for, for whatever is good and godly and appropriate that you should ask Him for, but then you say, that I will be done. Because I don't know that what I'm asking for is what I need. I don't know what I'm asking for is what's going to glorify you the most. And sometimes the things I would ask you for, I mean, Paul, when he's in prison, do you ever think he prayed to get out of prison? Probably. He was human, human like us. And yet he was incarcerated quite a bit. But the irony is that God used him tremendously. There's all manner of people who are grateful that they encountered Paul in prison. He was there for a reason. And sometimes the things that are hard and difficult and that we don't like, they're there for a reason too. In fact, not sometimes, but all the time. God is at work. So when we ask, we pray, but we say, uh, not my will, but thine be done. All right, we talked a little bit about Daniel. Uh, another one is Job, a devout man. Uh, we're reading Job, uh, I think it's Job 14. It says, so it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send out and sanctify them, that's his children, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt sacrifices according to the number of them all. 
You hear what he's doing? He cares for his kids. He loves his kids. What does he do? He prays for them. And he rises up early in the morning, offers burnt sacrifices, burnt sacrifices according to how many of the kids he had. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And so thus Job did regularly. How cool is that? Job was the most righteous man of his age. He was also a really good dad. <laughs> he's up, he gets up early. Not just for his own, you know, to be attentive to his own soul care, not just to pray to God on behalf of his own sin issues, but he also says, my kids, my kids could be a handful, and I think I'm going to go and pray to God on their behalf, on their behalf too. But the point is that that which was important to him, he found time for. That which was, in his view, is critical, urgent. He made sure to, to, to do, and not just do on occasion, but what does the verse say? Thus, Job did regularly, consistently. I don't know if it was every day of his life, but he did it with enough consistency that Scripture identifies it as, as such. All right, with devotion, I'll, I'll offer one more thought here, and then we'll get into spiritual disciplines, and then we'll, we'll pray. But in, in Luke chapter 2, after Jesus was born, so you have the manger scene, Jesus is born, his parents take him where? Does anyone remember? They took Jesus into the temple. Does anyone remember any of the, peop- the names of the people he- they met in the temple? Anna. Simeon and Anna. and Anna. Right, Simeon and Anna. Two older saints that were always in the temple. God had told Simeon that he would not pass until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Well, let me read you what happens in Luke 2. I'll, I'll kind of condense those two passages with Simeon and Anna. But it says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout. Those are two good words out on your tombstone. Just and devout. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. One of the, my favorite descriptions of Jesus Christ in, in any of the book. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. The long-awaited seed. The, the, the Messiah they'd been waiting for forever with tears rushing from Israelites' faces. The consolation of Israel. He's waiting for them. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, being Simeon. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Messiah. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. Now there was one named Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years. This was a very old woman who did not depart from the temple. Even though she was very old, she was very devout. She did not depart from the temple, but she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant when she encountered the Lord's Christ, she gave thanks to the Lord. We see this picture of, of devotion. Now, Simeon and Anna, in the scheme of things, they were not high and mighty in the temple. If, if you had been one of the priests or one of the Pharisees, one of the scribes, all you would have known was that's that old man. That's that old lady who's always, she's always here. I don't know what she's, what she's doing. I don't even remember her name, right? They did not match up with the, the locals there would have not have been that concerned, especially with Anna, who these individuals were. And yet, that particular day, these are the two people who had a divine appointment with the Lord's Christ. These are two people whose devotion, whose regular, consistent devotion, day by day by day, was honored with, by God in the best way he could honor them, by allowing them to see and maybe even to hold the baby Messiah. God, God values uh, our devotion, and he encourages it in these passages and, and many others that we don't have time for. So the point is this, that uh, if, if you're a lukewarm in matters of faith, the whole of the scripture would say, maybe it's time to heat things up. Maybe it's time to, to take some additional steps so that we can become more devout and more consistent in our, in our belief. All right, so how do, you, how do you do this? How do you develop spiritual uh, disciplines? Well, let me ask you, I guess, uh, straight out. When it comes to Bible reading, if someone in just a, a moment or two could share, is there any tool or tip or trick or anything you've utilized to, to get more into scripture? John, what do you got? The McShane reading program, right? So whether it's commentaries or tools or, or structured approaches, like you read one Old Testament you know, chapter, one New Testament, one Psalm, things like that, that's certainly helpful. What else do you got? For me, my, King James is my primary, but I keep a New Living Bible because it's easier to read. I get bogged down in Leviticus. Okay. Well, and consistency is how you become devout. 
Every one of us has read the Bible at some, I trust every one of us has read the Bible at some point. Did you read it yesterday? I won't ask you to raise hands. Did you read it the day before, the day before, and so forth? Devotion comes from consistently applying the things that we know and, and hold to be true. And my encouragement, if you're standing at the outside looking at that, going, wow, I'd be, I'm not there, and I don't even know where to begin, yeah, start easy. What I've told young people you know, who have challenges you know, working their way through Scripture or even just opening the book, as I say, I'll tell you what, we'll start in the easiest spot. Open the book of Proverbs. Pick one. One what? One one proverb. So pick one proverb. Let's start the simple. Let's put the bar fairly simple. The, the key, yeah, Psalms can work similarly, but the Proverbs literally can encompass one verse. But better it off is the man who reads one verse every day than the man who read one chapter every three weeks. Because the objective is to be consistent. Meditate over what you've been given. There's more riches in any one proverb than, you know, than we could ever possibly know. But Whatever the case is, the, the idea is, if you're asking, where do I start? It's okay to start with a fairly limited uh, 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 you know, object with how much I'm going to try to, to read in a given sit sitting or what have you. The idea is to build the habit, the habit of every day I will do this. Set an alarm. You know, the, these, you're, right now, you, you have the greatest single tool in the history of mankind for the application of spiritual practices. And what I mean by that is every translation of the Bible, you don't have to have one on your nightstand over here and one over here. Every translation you could possibly want in every commentary is right here at your fingertips. You can have it read aloud. When I'm driving, I've got a version on the Bible Gateway. I, forget, I don't even know who the speaker is, but I think it's in the ESV version. There's some guy with a gravelly voice and he reads it and it so, sounds so rich and raw, raw, raw. You know, I just, I love it. So I'll just listen, listen to that. This has all manner of different tools. It also has alarms you can set. You want to make sure to remember to read scriptures? Set an alarm. Have it go off every day. Do the, whatever. The amount of benefit you can have just from a singular tool along these lines. I wake up every morning and read my Bible. I wake up every morning and read my Bible, a verse out of whichever chapter, whichever uh, God lands me on. I don't like pick a book in the Bible. I just flip through it, let it, then follow it. So let me. Let, let, me give you, let me give you one bit of feed, feedback to that. That is better, better absolutely than those who never encounter the book. So absolutely, wherever you open it up and, and read it, you're encountering the inerrant, inspired word of God, and amen and amen. But in the big picture, as we grow in our, in our faith, there's value to working through uh, chapters and books as a whole because what can happen when we do the finger thing I've done the finger thing, you know? You're sitting there going, well, I don't have a lot of time to study. Or you're going, I got this issue in my life. What to do, oh God? And then you say to yourself, I'll lick my finger. I'll, I'll put it wherever. And wherever it lies, there's the answer, right? I'm sure that a number of folks have done that. What I would say is that's not really the direction you want to get to. It's helpful to, uh, to, to grow and, and read more, uh, more at a time. How about prayer? What has worked for anyone when it comes to praying? What's that? Writing? Writing out what you're praying? Yeah. That's interesting. I never heard of that. I okay. pray a lot. Like okay. all day. All right. In the even time. Hey, were you always that way? Pretty much. All right. Well, then, and, and in fairness, sometimes we have gifts. Prayer and certain things through the Spirit, sometimes they come even more naturally than, than, than for others. So we could go on, but there's, there's tools. What I would say, the main thing is be accountable in some way to yourself, to an app on your phone, or to someone who loves you, who will hold you accountable. If you, if you came up to me and said, Pastor, I'm going to try to pray every day this, this month or whatever, and I would need you to hold me accountable, I'll send you a text every day. Take, it, take me up on it. I'll text you every day and ask you, have you prayed? And you need to tell me what you're thinking or read scripture. My point is that there are people who will do that who will help, help hold you accountable if you need it. The question is not whether the tools exist to get this done. The question is how much do you want it? How much do you want it? And I submit to you that you should want it a lot since, since it's the primary focus of our Christian walk. All right, one last thought, and then we're going to end up uh, spending our time in prayer. Staying focused, this is one of the, the, the biggest challenges. 
many times we can have a, a spiritual moment or class like this, and we can say, yes, 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 I need to do such and such, and this is what I'm going to do about it. And we can drive home thinking about plans and the like. And then we might implement it again for a day or a week or what have you. The problem is that life happens. And there's any number of things that can distract us, especially when we're less mature in faith and especially when our habits are less well-formed. So the, the, the key when that happens is to remember it will happen. And when it comes up and distractions occur, do not let, you throw, throw, uh, do not let those things throw you off of what you know devotion to be, which is a consistent approach. And even if you have to circle back another day or another week back to something, circle back. Don't let it be an excuse like many of us have done on diets. I know I have. Yeah, I've, I've had a number of diets over the years where I've, I've gone in the right direction. You know, I'm looking at the scale saying things are going pretty good. Keep, keep this up. And then what happens? Oh, Thanksgiving week. Oh, And I say, I'll try hard, and then I find I didn't try that hard. And then what happens? You get in the start of December, and you say, well, uh, hmm, last week wasn't that, that great. My family has multiple birthdays in December. There are cakes all over the place. And then it's Christmas. Right? It is the hardest time in the world to, to stay, on, stay on track. But sometimes I've let that, in fact, many times, I've let that be a reason for <clears throat> to everything to fall apart. The key, especially when it comes to biblical matters and matters of faith, is that when you see it coming, and even if you don't see it coming, return to the mean. Return to the mean. Get back to, uh, to what you should be doing. And that's why accountability helps. If you're the only one who knows that you failed, guess what? You're far better at letting yourself down than you might be letting others down. If you tell other people what you're attempting to do, be it weight loss or what have you, there's a far greater likelihood, statistically a far greater likelihood, that you will actually attempt to, to work it out. All right, we could, we could go on all these things we've just touched upon here. Uh, big picture, habits and routines are important if you are to be more Christ-like, and consistency and devotion is what is the model that Scripture would have for us.